From CAFE, welcome to Stay Tuned. I'm Preet Bharara. We haven't really processed the eight years of W. Bush and Cheney. We don't yet fully understand what happened during those eight years and just how bad it was. That's Adam McKay. He's the director of Vice, the Oscar-nominated film about former Vice President Dick Cheney. I speak with him about the legacy of the Reagan Revolution, nostalgia for the Bush era, and why Cheney embraces the nickname Darth Vader. That's coming up. Stay tuned. Hey, stay tuned listeners. Throughout this past year, you've heard me talk about the ups and downs of writing a book. You've been here the whole time on this often arduous journey. It's done, so you can pre-order your own copy of This Labor of Love at doingjusticebook.com. Maybe even get a copy for the people in your life who love justice. You'll find various options, whether you need your two-day shipping or want it from your favorite local independent bookseller. And for those of you who become accustomed to my voice in your ear, there's always the audiobook, which I voiced myself. Order at doingjusticebook.com. I'm also doing a book tour. I'll be in New York City, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and even London. For information about the book tour and where I'll be, Go to cafe.com slash book. Books will ship this March 19th. Okay, let's get to your questions. Hi, Pre. This is Barry Bornstein from New Jersey. I was wondering if you could weigh in on whether the Southern District has enough information to actually use the uh, allegations against AMI made by Jeff Bezos to undo any agreements they already had, or if it's from the Mueller investigation, if if Mueller would do that. Thank you. Love the show. Thanks for your question, Barry. You know, Ann Milgram and I addressed this at some length in the uh, Cafe Insider pod, a sample of which was in the Stay Tuned feed, so I won't belabor the point except to say maybe one or two additional things. So further to what Anne and I discussed on Monday, there have been some additional developments in the reporting, both from the Bezos camp and also from the AMI camp. It appears that the source of the leak, the photographs and the intimate text messages, was Michael Sanchez, the brother of Lauren Sanchez, the woman with whom Bezos was having a relationship. Uh, There's also some reporting that Lauren Sanchez forwarded some photographs, perhaps, and or text messages from Jeff Bezos to her girlfriends. The relevance of that to me in in doing this analysis is I'm a little bit confused about the Jeff Bezos post on Medium, because in that post, he makes reference to Saudi Arabia. He makes reference to the work, perhaps, of a government agency, which many people have interpreted to be the government of Saudi Arabia, not the United States government. And if it was true this entire time that the source was not hacking by a foreign government, but was in fact simply Lauren Sanchez's brother, then query why he mentioned those things in the post. And while I do think it's a very serious question for the Southern District of New York to decide whether or not there's been a violation of the non-prosecution agreement, because the facts may make out a case of extortion, I still think, as I often say, it's worth you know keeping your powder dry a little bit and seeing what other facts come out. Just to play devil's advocate for a moment, from AMI's perspective, if AMI knew the entire time that Saudi Arabia was not involved, that there was no politics necessarily involved, and that they got the information from Michael Sanchez, and they understood Michael Sanchez's motivation, which may yet turn out to be political because he was friendly with Roger Stone, who was in turn very friendly with the President of the United States. But it is, I guess, conceivable that AMI had some understanding uh, as to what the nature of the leak was and what the motivation behind it was, in which case they would have some argument, I suppose, that they just wanted the truth to come out, and that is that there was no politics behind the leak. You know, of course, from Jeff Bezos' perspective, given the history and given the animosity of the president towards him, he has a logical reason for believing that the publication of those photos and the threat to publish additional photos was political. It still remains kind of a crazy coincidence who Michael Sanchez was associated with, what his politics were, and the timing of all of this, when AMI itself separately, which is why they have the non-prosecution agreement with the Southern District of New York, where where AMI has deliberately over time, on more than one occasion, engaged in behavior 
that was clearly to help the president of the United States politically. So while every good lawyer and prosecutor uh, who's trying to assess facts in the absence of knowing all the facts has to keep an open mind, which I always urge, it's worth just saying that there might be additional information that will come to light that might shade the issue a little bit. What's interesting to me, as I said when Ann and I were speaking about the subject, how far will the Southern District go to investigate the claim? And almost more importantly, how far will the Southern District go to investigate other claims of potential extortion? But, you know, the Southern District is not in a position to be speaking publicly about what it's doing. We won't know, perhaps, how long it's taking them to assess the allegations by Jeff Bezos and whether or not there are other instances of this. It might take some weeks. It might take some months. So I guess, as I often say, stay tuned. This next question comes via Twitter from Theo Meal. Hi, Pre Barara. What do you make of the CISI's reported conclusion, that's the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, what do you make of their reported conclusion that there was no conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russians? I'm not sure how seriously to take it. Thanks, love your show, hashtag ask pre. So that's a good question, and people have been talking about it this week, and let me make a, a few points about it. Number one, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is chaired by Republican Senator Burr, did not say that there was no conspiracy. It said there was no direct evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. And as a lot of other talking head lawyers have been saying over the last few days, there are two kinds of evidence. There's direct evidence and there's circumstantial evidence. And while lay people tend to think that circumstantial evidence is somehow less weighty than direct evidence, that's not true. Before any jury deliberates in any case in federal court and presumably most state courts, the judge instructs the jury that circumstantial evidence is entitled to absolutely the same weight as direct evidence. And as we also know from experience, that with respect to many, many, many conspiracy charges, prosecutors are never able to show direct evidence. They show inferences, especially if they don't have wiretaps or they don't have cooperating witnesses who can testify to the actual agreements and conspiratorial talk occurring in connection with the crime. Moreover, bear in mind, and this is going to be true also of Adam Schiff's committee, the Intel Committee in the House, although these congressional committees engage in investigation, and sometimes they can bring lots of bad things to light, and they can be fairly thorough. And I was involved in a few investigations myself, as I've mentioned before. They don't have the same tools as a U.S. attorney's office or as the special counsel. They don't have the ability to wiretap. They don't have the ability to flip witnesses. Also, their staffs are a lot smaller. They have fewer resources. On the other hand, it's not insignificant that Senator Burr, uh, has concluded that there was no direct evidence of collusion based on their own investigation. That's a good talking point for the president, and he will be using it. And we'll wait and see what the Mueller investigation shows, if anything. It's certainly possible that Bob Mueller's team also will not find direct evidence of such a conspiracy as well. We just have to wait and see. So it's one data point done by a congressional committee. Also significantly, the conclusion that's being reported by Senator Burr would mean a lot more, I think, to me and everyone else, if it was the joint conclusion, the joint bipartisan conclusion of both the chair and the ranking member, Senator Mark Warner, who reportedly does not agree with the conclusion. So let's wait and see what formally is uh, issued by the committee, and more importantly, wait and see what Bob Mueller has to say. This next question is about the El Chapo case, and it comes in a tweet from DJ Bird 70 At Preet Bharara, looking forward to your reviewing the many fascinating things uncovered in this trial, hashtag AskPreet, and he refers to a New York Times article entitled, El Chapo Convicted in Trial That Revealed Drug Cartels' Brutality and Corruption. So I don't have time to review all the fascinating things. Uh, I think we learned a lot about how the Mexican drug trade works. I think we learned a lot about how brutal uh, and terrible a person El Chapo was. I think we learned a lot about how much pain and agony he caused to people and how violent his enterprise was. So I'll just say one quick thank you and congratulations to my former colleagues across the river from SDNY, the fine folks at the Eastern District of New York, the U.S. attorney there, all the assistant U.S. attorneys, the DEA agents, the FBI agents, and all sorts of law enforcement agencies who made this happen. Quick footnote, uh, once upon a time when I was the U.S. attorney, we also had a case against El Chapo. Multiple U.S. attorney's offices in the, in the United States had cases against El Chapo. Different parts of his enterprise touched different districts in different ways. And we vied for the case as did the Chicago U.S. Attorney's Office and some others. But it was not to be a case to be tried in the Southern District of New York. That said, great work. We can all rest easier now that justice was done. 
And by the way, I want to echo what the presiding judge said in the case, how he was so proud to be an American when he saw that verdict come down. It's not an easy thing to sit in a jury, generally. It's really not an easy thing to sit in a jury when you're dealing with a case of someone who is so violent, whose enterprise has caused the death of so many people. And even though this trial didn't take place in Mexico, it took place in the United States, I think the jurors in that case deserve an extra special thank you as well. So thank you to Judge Kogan, thank you to the prosecution team, and thank you especially to the jurors in that case. So I wish I had time to answer more of your questions, but I got to get back to the cafe offices to hit some golf balls via my newly installed $50,000 golf simulator. My guest this week is Adam McKay. He's the director of the Oscar-nominated film Vice, a movie about Dick Cheney starring Christian Bale. McKay studied long-form improv at Second City and was one of the founding members of Upright Citizens Brigade. He went on to direct Anchorman, Anchorman 2, and The Big Short, the Academy Award-winning movie about the subprime mortgage crisis. We talk about Cheney's lasting influence, the subtle power of the VP, and what the nation has yet to confront about the Bush presidency. That's coming up. Stay tuned. Now more than ever, it's important to keep learning. The Great Courses Plus is a wonderful way to do that. The Great Courses Plus streaming service has audio and video lectures on a variety of topics like history, politics, business, and more. The information is reliable, fact-based, and fun to learn. Plus, each course is taught by subject matter experts who present all the information in a truly engaging way. Just like Stay Tuned, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere. You might want to start with the history of the Supreme Court. We've talked a lot about the court here on the show. The controversial nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, big cases, past and future. Here's your chance to learn even more. Or maybe you love RBG and want to know more about the personal stories of the other justices behind landmark Supreme Court decisions. Well, now you can. In this class, you'll go deep on the history behind the court, like how a former president became a chief justice and how one lawyer set out to undo Jim Crow laws in the South. To get a full free month of unlimited learning, check out thegreatcoursesplus.com slash preet. This limited time offer is only available at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash preet. So start your free month today. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash preet. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. But most of us don't do it properly. Quip is here to help. Quip is a better electric toothbrush designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and even enjoyable. We're supposed to brush our teeth for two full minutes, but who does that? This ad is 60 seconds long, so you could use this ad as a guide. Listen once, brush your bottom teeth, start the ad over, brush your top teeth, or you could just get Quip. Quip has a built-in two-minute timer. It pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides, helping to guide a full and even clean. And with sensitive sonic vibrations, Quip is gentle on your gums. Quip isn't like those old electric toothbrushes with a huge bulky charger hogging that one bathroom outlet. Instead, Quip runs for three months on one charge. That's why I love Quip. According to their website, they're backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash preet right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. Mine just came in the mail. That's your first refill pack free at getquip dot com slash preet. As many of you know, we recently launched Cafe Insider. It's a subscription service to help you make sense of what's happening. We're living through historic times, and Insider is an opportunity to gain deep understanding of the most pressing issues at the intersection of law and politics. Every Monday, Ann Milgram joins me for the Cafe Insider podcast where we break down the latest headlines and answer your questions. We all know there's more news to come. Mueller's investigation, congressional hearings, and the impending presidential campaign. So we hope you'll join us as an insider on what promises to be a wild ride. Rest assured, the Stay Tuned podcast will continue to be free, but the Cathay Insider membership service allows you to support our work 
so we can keep doing what we do. So go to cafe.com slash insider to become a member today. That's cafe.com slash insider. Adam McKay, thank you so much for being on the show. It is my pleasure. Uh, Preet, thanks for having me on. So congratulations on the Academy Award nomination for your movie, Vice. Is that exciting? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, this was a challenging and very divisive film, obviously. So uh, to get that kind of recognition is nice. And most of all, helps to get people out to the uh, theaters, which is what we want. So, you know, that's all well and good that you have this Oscar nomination. I would rather spend our hour talking about Ron Burgundy. Can we do that? Uh, by the way, I would have no problem with that. And I'm not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, I was joking. I was joking. But you know what? That's that's one of the great movies, Anchorman. As fun as it is, too. It uh, it, it sadly was a little ahead of the curve on the, the fall of news. Yeah. <laughs> Certain kinds so. of news. The panda story. I mean, how many times through the years now have we seen the panda story? I think at one point Fox was doing it. Instead of a big story, they were doing a pan. Do pandas have more sex than other zoo animals? Was the story that Fox was running during one of those days when it was proved the president was part of a criminal conspiracy? <laughs> and that was the story they were going with. Are you going to leave us hanging? Do, do pandas have more sex? Uh, you have to watch the piece. It's beautifully done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay, let's get back to the to the movie in theaters right now, Vice. So the central character is Dick Cheney. I was um, fortunate enough to be invited to see a preview. I love the movie. People should go see it. I think it's great. We'll talk more about it in a second and how you made it. But I remember you're saying in the Q&A at the screening that you spent a lot of time reading about Dick Cheney. How much research did you do? How much time did you put into learning about the former vice president? You know, it was kind of part of the whole process of writing the script. I mean, there were a good three or four months that were just me reading all the great books. You know, Jane Mayer's book, The Dark Side, and Barton Gelman, Angler, and Korn, and Isikoff, Hubris. I mean, on and on. Out, Ron Suskind wrote three books about the Bush years. And then you get into the autobiographies by all the players. There's another six or seven and then you go back and read all the pieces about the imperial presidency of Nixon. You read about the Ford era. And then there's like another 50, 60 great articles out there. Um, so it was a lot. And then to top it all off, we hired our own journalist who went around the country and interviewed a bunch of people off the record. As you know, that's when people will really talk to you. So we got a lot of good information out of that. Why did you feel it necessary to have to do so much research? You know, there's a lot of different reasons we made the movie, but one thing, too, that's just frustrating about our world nowadays is that everything's seen through that red or blue lens, partisan lens, and we wanted to make sure what we showed in the movie was accurate to what the man did, to what he and his wife did, to what the country did, to what the Republican Party did. And, you know, I think a lot of the stuff for people like yourself, for people, you know, who follow politics day in, day out, probably know a decent amount of the stuff, but just wanted to make sure everything was spot on because at the end of the day, I wanted it to be an accurate record. I wanted it to be as accurate a character depiction as we can possibly do. And also wanted to understand where he was coming from more. So accuracy was very important. What surprises were in store for you when you finally delved down into the life and times of Dick Cheney? Biggest surprise was that Dick Cheney was such a normal kid. There's really no big kind of shocking revelation from his childhood. Both his parents were FDR Democrats. He played baseball, he played football, he's a B student, kind of a smart aleck. And really his whole first act is about Lynn Vincent, uh, who would become Lynn Cheney. That's his story, is that he met her and she was the most beautiful girl in Wyoming, straight A student, baton twirling champion. And he just fell for her in a giant way. And it was her. She was the one who was pointed out of the state. She had the ambition. And because he fell for her, he started going down that path. And by the end, he ended up becoming the master of, you know, of power, the, the, the real genius of how to manipulate the system and understanding the bureaucracy of government. But um, that really surprised me that the first act is not Dick Cheney's. It's really Lynn Cheney's. How did he get her to fall for him? He was crazy about her from the second he moved there. He moved to Wyoming when he was 11 years old from Nebraska and right away saw her 
uh, and her aunt too, I guess, looked like a movie star. So the two of them were walking across the street. He was like, oh my God, she didn't pay him any mind. And it was right before homecoming. She was Miss Mustang and Lynn's boyfriend dumped her. He was the quarterback on the football team and a friend of Dick's. So Lynn's best friend, Joan, had been dating Dick for about three years. Lynn knew Dick had a crush on her. So she just went over to Dick and said, Dick, would you like to take me to the dance? And that was it. Dick dumped his girlfriend, left her in tears, went with Lynn, and history was written. And he was on, he was on his path yeah. to White House jobs. We talked to Joan, actually. We actually got in touch with her and the old girlfriend. And yeah, yeah, that's well, a lot they... of people say that whoever Lynn married would have made it to the White House. Yeah, they, they say whoever she would have married would have been president or vice president, and they say that to this day. Can you feel it, Dick? Half the room wants to be us, the other half fears us. I know George is next in line, but after that, who knows? I respect the hell out of Reagan, but no one has shown the world the true power of the American presidency. Uh, she's such a force of nature. Well, I mean, you know, you know, she worked at the think tanks. She's written, what, like 12 books. She's very charismatic. I've seen tapes of her on talk shows and feels like someone you wouldn't want to mess with. And I can't imagine, you know, a woman like that back in the late 50s. You know, part of the story was, too, she worked for a guy who ran an oil company, and he wanted to give her a scholarship to Yale, but no women were allowed into Yale at that time. So she said, well, why don't you give it to my boyfriend, Dick? And that's how he got his scholarship to Yale. She, trans she transferred the offer to her husband. Yeah. That's yeah it was back in the days where certain rich guys would just have a couple scholarships that could dole out as they <laughs> right. saw fit. Yeah, that's, And that's uh, an he was like, oh, gosh, Lynn, you're so smart. I wish I could give it to you, but there's no women at Yale. Well, what about my boyfriend? And that was it. And then, of course, he flunked out about a year and a half, two years later. So when did he get his act together based on your research and, and reading so he flunked out of yale came back to casper at wyoming and got a job uh hanging power lines apprentice lineman and he was hitting it pretty hard i mean that's a hard drinking kind of life and meanwhile lynn was graduating from colorado college straight a student and then it started to get really bad then dick cheney started to get duis and really hanging with a rough crowd and that's kind of the precipitating scene of the whole movie is when she sits him down, basically says, you choose me or you choose this. And when she put it that way, he white knuckled it. He chose her. He stopped drinking on that job. He started cold turkey, getting, just right there, right? right cold, the spot. old school, you know, 1950s, 1960s, cold turkey. Exactly. A lot like uh, George W. Bush did. Right. Let me ask you a question. So you, you did a lot of research and you wanted to get it exactly right. What kind of pushback have you gotten from the Cheney family and or, you know, Cheney supporters who may not love the portrayal in the film? There's no response from the Cheney family. They know it's accurate. The only thing we get is, and you see this all the time in our modern press, there's certain outlets that kind of like insinuate that it's not accurate. I read the piece and I'm like, well, you didn't say what wasn't accurate. Or there have been a few that like say it's not accurate. And then they show their research, and their research is incorrect. So there's this kind of assumption, because it's a Hollywood movie, that it's not accurate. But I'm, I'm still waiting for someone to point out something in the movie that's not, not accurate. I've yet to see it. Well, I guess my reaction is, having seen it and enjoyed it, that some people might not like the portrayal because they think he's painted a little bit as a villain, which I didn't fully see. You know, it, he had certain things that he did. He moved us towards a particular war, and he had certain attributes. Do you think of him as, as a villain in the political history of the country? We weren't trying to portray it one way or the other. I mean, I, I've actually heard some people on the left complain that the movie is too kind to him. Wilkerson, Colin Powell's old uh, right-hand guy, was complaining it wasn't harsh enough. You know, to me, the story's Cheney story mirrors America's story. You know, it's a guy who found ambition, wanted to make his wife proud, wanted to make his family proud. And then that ambition and that desire to make good turned into something darker. And that is kind of what happened to America. So I don't believe anyone's just born evil. I don't think it's the way it works. So I really 
was looking at what happened to this guy. How did he end up in the place that he ended up by the end, which without question is as a leader who, who did a lot of destruction. So that, that was the way I looked at it. And in that lens, it played more like a, a tragedy to me, a tragedy for the world, for the country, for him, for his family. And it was more about a sense that we had lost something kind of essential by that time. Do you think that Dick Cheney is evil? I just don't know what the word evil means. I mean, can people become twisted? Can people's minds become bent through circumstance, through addiction, through pain, through trauma? Yes. And would you call that position they would reach? Would some call it evil? Sure. Did Dick Cheney get to a place like that by the end where through power, through paranoia, that he did some awful stuff. Yes. But I just, I don't use the word evil. I, I really, I don't use good and evil. I don't think they're very helpful. Well, the reason I ask is, so the amazing performance by Christian Bale, uh, who, when, when I first saw the news report that this movie was coming out, and Christian Bale would be playing Dick Cheney. At first I thought that's nuts. And then I thought, well, of course, because Christian Bale can play anyone. But yeah. I, I believe at the Golden Globes, uh, where he won Best Actor, I don't know how much this was tongue in cheek and how much of it was serious. He thanked in his speech uh, Satan, which was a reference to Dick Cheney. Is that is that a way of calling him evil? Was that fair? Well, Satan, in fairness, not necessarily in connection to Cheney. Satan helped us in other regards with this movie. He helped us get financing. He was no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was kidding. Should we go back was, to pandas? <laughs> he was he was totally tongue in cheek. Okay, uh, I, I think he was saying that to make me laugh, and I think he was poking fun at once again just extremes in our country. That... Well, there's there's this whole thing where Dick Cheney was portrayed as Darth Vader, and Christian Bale refers to him as as Satan. Is there a part of based on your knowledge? Is there a part of that image that Dick Cheney and people around him actually sort of embrace in reciprocal tongue in cheek manner? Oh, absolutely. He's very public. Well, as public as Dick Cheney can be. But he has said he gets a kick out of it. I think one year, some of his grandkids dressed up as Darth Vader. It's a very open joke in the family. Yeah, so he owns it. He completely owns it. You know, I actually think that the part of the movie that probably rattled some people more than anything else is, you know, depicting the Reagan revolution and depicting how America changed. And I've heard some people say, oh, you're just going after the Republicans. I'm like, no, not really. But there was a giant historical change in this country that we don't talk about in proper terms. Let's talk about it. What was the change? I mean, the change was the Republican Revolution, the Reagan Revolution of the late 70s, early 80s. And we are still living in that revolution. Some would call it the counter-revolution to uh, FDR's New Deal. But it was, you know, very skillfully and purposely done. I mean, you know, millions and millions of dollars came into Washington, D.C. They built the right-wing think tanks. They, the talking points were lining up. Uh, you had your perfect kind of lead actor as the president, Ronald Reagan. And he gets in, and the American Enterprise Institute gives him a list of policies they want. And by the end of his eight years, he's done 76% of them. And the whole country starts to change and swing to the right. To the point where now, you know, we have Democrats that would have been like Republicans back in the 70s and 60s because the country's swung so far to the right. And I just feel like we don't talk about that enough, that we are living in the Republican revolution. You know, when Bill Clinton got into office, we're like, hey, it's a Democrat, and then instantly behaved like a Republican. And everything is so far to the right. How did Bill Clinton instantly be, start behaving like a Republican? You know, he dismantled uh, welfare, signed the deregulation of the banks. Uh, a lot of his laws that he passed concerning crimes and, and justice were pretty hard to the right. Did a lot of things that would have been considered very Republican. In fact, would have been considered very, very right wing uh, during any other time. Well, so how do you consider Obama's time? As compared to uh, the... Obama, I would say as well. I would say Obama was like a moderate. And I think Obama did a lot of good stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I did definitely voted for him both times. But, you know, I think he used unitary executive theory. I think there's some things he did I didn't agree with. I wish he had prosecuted the bankers. Definitely thought there was enough evidence. I think he'd let them off the hook. And 
It's a very Republican thing to do to let let big money off the hook, especially when they've contributed to your campaign. So I didn't love that. I didn't love that there wasn't a more serious investigation into uh, into the Iraq war and torturing. But I also get each president kind of forgives the one before, but I think that's got to stop at some point. So I would say Obama was more moderate, but I, I would put Bill Clinton to the right of the spectrum with his presidency. And I, I think a lot of those decisions have proven not to be wise decisions and have not aged well at all. So I'm just intrigued by this point that you made that we don't talk enough about the Reagan revolution, the Republican revolution, but we've had these iterations of Democratic and Republican presidents since so here we are in 2016. No, I'm sorry. Here we are in 2019. <laughs> I, I long for a prior time, apparently. Uh, <laughs> no, well, by the way, not a great time that you picked. Well, Still a bad year. <laughs> well, up to November or something. Yeah, there you go. So where do you think we are now in terms of that arc and the consequences of what you refer to as the Republican Revolution? Are we? Is it receding a little bit? Are we still in a structure where the things that Reagan did, in your view, remain? And what's the possibility for change going forward? And, and by the way, to make it clear, not just that Reagan did, that was just the beginning of it. There's been many other, you know, Newt Gingrich and and W. Bush and Cheney and Ryan. And now, of course, Mitch McConnell uh, is would definitely be one of the, the big faces of it. In fact, if anything, I think it's the full bloom of the Republican revolution is what we're living in now. I mean, it was always a coalition that was built from old money families like Richard Mellon Scaife and the Coors and the Cokes and on and on. And the reaction to Roe versus Wade, so the evangelicals, and of course the reaction is civil rights. So white working Southerners who were who were pissed about civil rights. That was always the coalition it was kind of built upon. And then obviously massive corporations came in off the Powell memo and and then lobbying kind of flourished. So, I mean, you know, let's be honest. That's basically who's been running our country for the past 30 or 40 years, walk around Congress. I think we all know people write checks and they get their votes. And I would say Trump and, and this kind of insane circus-like atmosphere we're in right now is kind of the, the full bloom of it. I hope it is. Could it get worse? Yes, it could. I could end up saying this. It and could always we'll- get worse. I mean, people, we, I had, I've interviewed... Um- Harry Reid, former Senate Majority Leader, who said, you know, he really, really had a problem with George W. Bush, didn't get along great with him, thought he did a lot of damage to the country, said that he was the worst president ever. And I can't remember if these were his words, but he said then Trump came along and made George W. Bush look like Churchill. Yeah. I That, that bothers me when people say that. I, I think it minimalizes you know, between 600,000 and a million deaths in Iraq. I get that some people think that the symbolic position of president is very important and they like the fact that W. Bush and Cheney pretended better. Uh, and I think that's really what that's about. That Trump. What, is, what does that mean? So you, you said that, and I thought that was a fascinating thing that you say, that they pretended better, pretended to be what better? They kept up the appearances somewhat of being a normal White House. You could see the cracks clearly, but they at least made an effort to walk out with a stiff back and shake people's hands and to say things that were vetted by advisors and the State Department. And there at least, if you squinted your eyes during the W. Bush Cheney years, it kind of looked like a normal functioning White House. There's no way to squint your eyes on the Trump White House. I mean, just all all form is out the window. They've, they've basically dismantled portions of the federal government, the State Department included. They don't say things in a normal way. They don't behave in a normal way. They openly and flagrantly lie and like dare people to call it out. So it's very upsetting to see what Trump's doing. But I think anyone who talks about missing Bush and Cheney, I man, I, I just that makes me queasy to be honest. There's a is lot it a little of- bit are people putting form over substance, you think? You don't think there's a substantive difference, even though it may be the case that the current president hasn't done some of the things that you don't like that the Bush White House did, that a lot of the reason people are up in arms is because they see future risk based on the behavior of the president. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'm in total agreement with that. And it's very upsetting to me. And when I see kids put in cages, that's pretty evil stuff. And when you see the future risk of shutting down our borders, 
of hostility towards journalists. This is scary stuff. These are motions and these are, this is rhetoric that points towards a pretty dark version of fascism could. The only thing I don't like is to go back and say, kind of makes you Miss Bush. Like we can all say Trump is scary and dangerous, but we don't need to go back and then somehow say Bush is Cheney or better. Like it's just a weird instinct and, and kind of dark and I think dismissive. And I think in a way it kind of shows how we haven't really processed the eight years of W. Bush and Cheney. We don't yet fully understand what happened during those eight years and just how bad it was. People like to make things into comparisons. There's no real comparison. It's one continuous story, you know, that we're in the middle of. Once again, I would call the Reagan Revolution or the Republican Revolution. Can we talk for another minute or two about Dick Cheney's personality and how that affected his leadership? Because it's, it's actually fascinating to me, and I wonder what you think about this. You know, Dick Cheney is someone, and he's portrayed in the movie this way, I think largely as well. He, uniquely among politicians, did not care whether people liked him or not. <laughs> or, or maybe that's a myth. He, he didn't care about popularity. You know, we've talked already about how he embraced and owns this persona of being Darth Vader, Satan, etc. And I guess my question is, is that in some way to be applauded? Is that refreshing in some way? Because, you know, most politicians can be accused of pandering and looking to increase their popularity and doing and not doing unpopular things that they think are right. Now, it may be that you you think that what Dick Cheney thought was right was misguided. Is there some value in having more people who at least are like Cheney in the in the sense that they care less about what people think about them and about looking good and about popularity than about getting their agenda accomplished? It's a really interesting question because there are flip sides to everything, right? I was talking with a friend of mine about the unitary executive theory and you know the, this strong interpretation of it that gives the president tremendous powers. I was talking about how dangerous it was, talking about how Cheney really pushed for it, how you're seeing, even to some degree, Obama used it a little bit, and you're seeing it with Trump, too, in a, in a bigger, much more potentially frightening way. At the same time, global warming is clearly becoming a bigger and bigger threat. It could be the end of us, literally. You know, In fact, statistically, according to the data, it's going to be the end of us. So my friend says, well, what about unitary executive to help with global warming? And I go, huh. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so all of a sudden, there's a version of unitary executive that could save mankind. And it's the same, I think, with what you're talking about. You're talking about like a Dick Cheney who's not caught up in public opinion polls, who's not caught up in cheap applause breaks and hollow sort of inspirational speak as opposed to real choices and real policy. And the way he used it was to you know, some degree dismantle our democracy and to build his own power and influence. I mean, I think what we're hoping for is someone who can have that same approach to that, but use it in a constructive way. Someone yeah, so with the courage. It's about the agenda, right? So would you welcome, would you embrace politicians who have an agenda that's more in line with yours, who, like Dick Cheney, don't really give a damn about looking good on television and, you know, having uh, adoring crowds chanting their name? Well, here's the irony of it. The second you start doing that, people love you. And the perfect example of that is Bernie Sanders. I mean, the guy's hair is going left. It's going right. <laughs> he speaks in that odd cadence. Okay, the gesticula- Bernie people, right? That's Adam McKay. <laughs> he lives in Hollywood somewhere. Don't, don't tweet at me. I mean, the guy was competitive. He's a democratic socialist from Vermont, but he doesn't chase polls. I mean, ask anyone who works with him. He, I don't even think he likes to do polling. I mean, that works for, for better or for worse. What's the famous FDR line when he says, you know, the robber barons are all coming after him and he says, they hate me. And he says, well, I welcome their hatred. And it's this huge applause line like, oh man, this guy's going right at it. And I think you're seeing that a little bit with AOC right now. I mean, she's just taken the, the attacks and she's dancing her way through them, and she knows where they're coming from. It's she's, a corrupt She's a bit system. more, even even her conservative adversaries, I think, would admit that she's a little bit more charming than Dick Cheney. <laughs> and I've, I've not seen a Dick Cheney dance video, although I would pay a lot of money to see that. You, that's probably one of the scenes you cut from, uh, from I, the I film. actually found it, and I, I destroyed it for the betterment of humanity. So, uh, no, no one will ever see that. 
<laughs> Maybe that's a way he can rehabilitate himself if he turns out to be a great, a great dancer. George W. Bush, the best thing that happened to George W. Bush in part, and I can tell what your view is going to be, that, you know, that there was a passage of time, Trump got elected, and Bush learned how to paint. And then he danced on uh, Ellen, remember? Right. How could I forget? Here's the other thing about Dick Cheney that is just deeply interesting to me. You know, I, I worked in the Senate for a while. I met a lot of politicians. There was the very rare politician who didn't have a higher ambition. And it's the rare vice president who doesn't seek to replace the president. And I've always wondered if this was just, you know, a myth or if it's true. And I, I tend to think it's true that Dick Cheney really did not have that longing to ascend to, to president. And that was the thing that allowed George W. Bush to feel comfortable giving his vice president as much power as he did, because he was never ultimately a threat to him in the same way that other presidents might view vice presidents. I think that's accurate. The thing we found about Dick Cheney was he's in some ways a, a fantastic codependent. And we say early in the movie that he'll be a servant to power, and he's a great servant to his wife, Lynn, and he's a great servant to his mentor, Don Rumsfeld, and on and on to Ford and to uh, W. Bush. And in the sense that the way that Dick Cheney gains power is by helping the person he serves bring their power to high fruition or his interpretation of their power. So I think you're correct. I think Dick Cheney knew he couldn't be president. He knew he wasn't a good enough campaigner. That's not his strength. He's a backroom guy. I also wonder, just too, if he didn't find the business of campaigning kind of unpleasant. I think by the end of his time in Wyoming, he was but essentially... He to, but he had to do it. Vice president may be you know, a job that's equivalent to a bucket of spit, as someone once said, but you still have to go out and do the rallies and do the campaigning. It's not like you get a buy on that. Yeah, yeah, and they got him out there. I mean, he knew, he knew his character. His character was the low-key professional, the grown-up who was going to take care of the military. I mean, that's what he was cast as. But then there's his other quality that, as we're discussing it, that's not so common among people generally, even among successful people. Tremendous self-awareness. We've all seen people who are members of Congress and or business people and or senators who really have no business, I hate to say it, no business thinking that they can become president. Although, you know, the, the myth is anyone can run for president because they lack, you know, either a moral compass or campaigning skills. Or, but but they're all, they all think that they can do a thing when many of them cannot. I'm not trying to come up with a whole laundry list of things necessarily that we could applaud in Dick Cheney. But I, but I do think it's a rare quality to have self-awareness and to have an understanding of what your limitations are when certainly people are dangling in front of you all these possibilities. It wasn't like, you know, everyone around Dick Cheney, I don't think, it wasn't like everyone around Dick Cheney was saying, man, you can never be president. You're not good enough to be president. You're good enough to be vice president. You're good enough to be a cabinet secretary. You're good enough to be the most powerful vice president in history, but you're not good enough to be president. Lots of people, I'm sure, were telling him, you could be president and you should be president. And he resisted that because of his own understanding of himself, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I say about Cheney, and it always takes people aback, is he's brilliant. He has an eye for detail and an understanding of the intricate levers and gears and wheels of government. And he has a patience that you rarely see in anyone. I mean, you know, if you go back through history as far as power in the shadows, who do you think, like Talleyrand with Napoleon? I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a pretty short list of people who could do this. And how many people would have looked at the vice presidency and seen that opportunity, known that, wait a minute, the, the founding fathers kind of underwrote the vice president. It's not really clearly defined. And it's defined by the discretion of the president. And Cheney sniffed that out and really felt it. I just think there's so many other people that never would have thought in those terms. I want you to be my VP. You the solution to my problem. Uh, I'm CEO of a large company. I have been uh, Secretary of Defense. I have been the Chief of Staff. Uh, the Vice Presidency is mostly a uh, symbolic job. Right, right. I can see how that wouldn't be uh, enticing to you. However, the vice presidency is also defined by the president. And if we were to come to a uh, different understanding. Uh-huh. Go on. I'm listening. 
I think, you know, the thing when he was going to run for president, you know how it works. You run for president once. You usually poll horribly. People barely know who you are. And then the second time you come out, now they kind of know who you are. And then you got a chance. So Cheney looked at that first time where he was going to run, where he was polling very low. And he made a couple decisions. He made a decision. I'm not great at campaigning. And he made a big decision that he loves his daughter. And if you step into that fray, someone could go after his daughter. And he didn't want any part of that. Yeah, he knows himself. He knew who he was. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he was good at. And then most of all, he just had this incredible patience. I mean, he could just wait out his opportunities better than anyone I've seen in recent history. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to separate out this conversation, sort of illuminating the difference between bad agenda and bad ideas, whether it's the unitary executive theory that you don't like and others don't like or something else, versus personal qualities. And the personal qualities we've discussed, and this, I think, may be upsetting to some people listening to this because they find him to be odious. And I wonder how much of that is based on his advocacy for certain policies and his uh, leading us into war. Whereas, on the other hand, I think the movie makes very clear he loves his family very much. He's very good to his wife. He cares about his daughter. He's self-aware. He's not himself necessarily looking for the limelight. And I just wonder how you separate those things out, having spent more time in the psyche of Dick Cheney than most people on earth. <laughs> that is for sure. Well, that's that's what it is. I mean, you have to look at the skills of the man. You have to look at who the guy is. I mean, you know, here's something people don't know about Dick Cheney. He does all the shopping for the family and he does all the cooking and apparently quite a good cook. And we talked to some friends of the family is as dedicated to his family as anyone you're ever going to meet, which is why I felt the tragedy of the ending when finally the, the family was kind of ripped apart through power. No, there's a lot of good qualities there. There's a lot of great, great skills as a politician, as a, as a, a bureaucratic operator. But I think you can look at all, all characters throughout history that way. You, you can look at the skill and the intelligence, and then you look at what aims they were put towards, and, and they were odious in this case. So I think you can say you don't like Dick Cheney, you find him repulsive, but man, did he know what he was doing, and he did it very skillfully. I think that's a, a fair statement. It's also odd, because on the one hand, he has been described as the most powerful vice president in history up to that time. And, you know, jokes about how he was really the president and he was really the, the boss and the superior over George W. Bush, who, who people made fun of, I think, not altogether with merit necessarily, which is another controversial thing to say, because I think he's a smart guy. And on the other hand, he was the true subordinate. And I think, I think you've said this in interviews, that he allowed George Bush to be the, the president with no challenge to him and was in, you know, deep service to the president. It's an odd situation, and maybe it's an awkward way of saying it, that he was he was simultaneously subordinate and superior in that role as vice president. Is that I fair? I actually think that's a perfect way of saying it. I think that describes the essence of Cheney, and, and that's exactly it. When Christian Bale and I talked about how he's kind of the ultimate codependent. Right. That's what you're really talking about. Through being subordinate, through being of ultimate service, he actually is able to bring out in the person the things that give him his own power. And it's a very complicated process he's going through because it's not a guy who's bullying or pushing or yelling. I have a feeling you it would feel really good to have Dick Cheney on your right side whispering into your ear. He probably is very calming. He's very knowledgeable. I could see how he would be seductive. You know, I mean, let's face it, with... Ford, after Ford lost, said his biggest regret was listening to uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld on on uh, ditching Rockefeller and tacking hard to the right. But Ford wanted to get reelected, and he had that calming professional next to him, and he listened to him. That contradiction we found really fascinating. And you even see it in his physicality. And so much of the movie, too, the answers about Dick Cheney's character are in Bale's physicality. If you actually look at physically how he's playing him, there's a lot of answers there. And that, that sort of slumped, almost kind of like always oh, carrying those papers in his hand, like he's trudging off to his next meeting to be told what to do, is kind of the way he carries himself. But of course, we know that's not the case. It's like a Columbo move, you know, where you're. Yeah, a Columbo move, exactly, in the sense that Columbo was hiding shrewdness and coming across as sort of clunky. Whereas Cheney, coming across the way he did, was cultivating 
you know, a perception of power, right? People people thought that guy had a lot of power, and maybe he did. Largely he did, but but he spent a lot of time cultivating, not, not hurt by the fact that he, you know, shot his friend in the face, and then his friend apologized to him. <laughs> Crazy. Douglas Fife described talking to Cheney. He said, you start talking to Cheney, and your voice is in one octave. And as you're talking to him, it's going up. It's going up because you're getting more and more nervous. He's giving you less and less. And then by the end of the conversation, you're up here. Okay. All right, Mr. Vice President. (laughs) (laughs) And Fife called him one of the most intimidating men he's ever been around. And you remember H.W. Bush, too. There there were some people debating exactly how much power did Cheney have in the Bush White House and exactly how clueless was W. Bush. And, you know, we could probably debate that forever. And there's a bunch of books written about it. But H.W., you know, later said, I regret recommending Cheney as vice president. I didn't know he was going to run a shadow empire out of the White House on my son. But his power, Dick Cheney's power, did wane in the second second term of George W. Bush. It was the Syria issue, right? Where they're going to bomb Syria. And by then, Bush had kind of gotten wise. He'd already let Rumsfeld go. And there was talk that Syria was building, I think they were building a nuclear reactor. Cheney, surprise, surprise, said, we got to go in and bomb them. And for the first time, Bush had finally figured it out. He said, uh, how many people here agree with the vice president? No one raised their hand. Yeah. And that was it. I think it's when Gates had become uh, Secretary of Defense, right? And uh, it was game over at that point. Do you think that Bush ultimately found Cheney to be sort of disloyal? Yeah. Yeah. I think the not pardoning Scooter Libby says a lot, a ton. And, you know, I've, I've heard from interviewing some people off the record that he was pretty pissed. And he really got W. Bush in some ways really pushed around by Cheney. And what Cheney was so great at doing was, when I say pushed around, I mean by how much information he shares, when he shares information, what he kept away from W. Bush. It was kind of incredible how much he kept W. Bush out of the loop. And I think when W. Bush started to realize a lot of that, he was he was pretty astounded. Yeah, nobody likes that. It, what Can you describe the genre that your movie is in? Is it a comedy? I call it a tragedy um, (laughs) uh, because tragedies tend to be pretty darn funny uh, for the front half because everyone thinks everything's good. King Lear was a hoot. (laughs) I mean, King Lear is pretty funny. The first quarter of King Lear, where he's so convinced this line of succession is going to work and so full of himself and, uh, and of course, ends in madness. But I I call it... uh, I call it a tragedy. It's, but, but there are comic elements in it, right? And and you have a background in that. And I wonder how important was that to achieve the effect that you wanted to achieve? It was very uh, conscious choice for myself and my editor. We were trying to reflect this upside down orange plastic world that we live in right now, which seems to be without genre because there are days I laugh very hard and there are days where I tear up. And there are days where I'm terrified and I've just never seen the world flip and flop so much like it is now between terror and comedy and absurdity. And there are headlines I have to read three times because I can't believe them. So we wanted that to be in our movie. We wanted audiences not to know exactly what part of the seat to sit on. Should it be the front part of the seat, the back, the side? And we wanted them to feel off balance, much like the world is now and the world was during that time. So we tried to make a genreless movie, but ultimately I would describe it as a tragic comedy, I guess, if I had to. Well, there's good laughs in it. Yeah. And and good thinking in it. Can I tell you the thing that, um, that I'm most impressed by in your background? Can you guess what it is? I'm curious. What? The Upright Citizens Brigade. (laughs) Improvisation, I think, is the most incredible thing that people can do. I remember being in college and watching the, you know, the one of the college improv groups and sitting in the audience and thinking, I, I don't know how they do that. You know, they couldn't have planned it in advance, you know, because premises are thrown at them and it's an exercise and they, they weave together a story and, and hilarious funny jokes that are made even more funny because the audience knows that it's the, the brain thinking in that moment. So th- the fact that you were able to do improv and be part of the creation of a great improv group, you know, a famous one, a legendary one. Does that mean you're just, are you smarter than other people? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, there's a lot of people who do improv very well. And I was extremely lucky that I got to go to Chicago when the, the creator of long form improv, Del Close was actually teaching. So I got to have him as my teacher for five, six years, which I still can't believe I got that experience before he sadly passed away. Um, it's an incredible form. It teaches you a lot of things. It, for me, it, it really taught me how to write. You know, the fundamentals of improvisation are really writing fundamentals, but the fact that you're doing it on your feet and it's so active helps me with directing as well. But I find it's, that odd. Can I just ask you about that? So you create a screenplay and you write all the words down. I'm, I'm guessing you're sitting at a desk and not sort of, you know, acting it out. With, maybe you did it this way. I don't know. Did, did you did you get a bunch of people in a room and you sort of um, write the script from an improv? Probably not. You're You're very careful... There are people that do that. Yeah. You know, uh, Mike Lee, the, the great director from the UK, does that. He gets his actors together and he has them improvise and he starts writing it down. So really, in a way, the actors are writing the script with him. But you're equally I, comfortable both sort of erupting in the moment with comedy and dialogue and story and also sitting quietly with the candle burning at your desk? I love writing at my desk. Yeah, it's really one of the more enjoyable parts of making a movie. And when I say improv teaches writing, you know, really what, what Del Close did with improv and all the people who learned from him is you're just breaking apart the components of how you make a scene. How do you create a play? How do you create a piece of theater? And the way you're doing it is kind of in reverse in a way. And so you, you just get to all those sort of creative uh, forks in the road. And that's what Dell would do. He would take you to the creative fork in the road and he'd stop everything and he'd go, okay, here we are at this creative fork in the road where you have to, someone has said something to you and you have to respond to it. But also it teaches you more than right. Does it teach you confidence? Do you have to be incredibly confident to attempt improv or is it the reverse? I think there's some confidence to it. I, I remember, you know, the you know, the famous actors nightmare you, that people have of uh, actors have, and what it is is you show up for the opening night of your play and you realize you don't know any right. of the lines. <laughs> right. So I had that dream one time, and it was opening night, and I'm doing a one man show, and I haven't prepared anything. And in the dream, I went, "Oh, it's no big deal. I'll just improvise it." <laughs> How'd that work out for you? And then uh, the dream just became a normal show. Give me a word. I did a one-man imp improvised show. It wasn't the greatest show, but like, you know, no one knew. When you and, when you woke up, did you write it all down? Uh, I didn't remember too much of the specifics, but I do remember the total absence of terror that would have normally been there and just going, ah, no big deal. I'll just improvise it. I think I read somewhere that you will be directing the movie about Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos scandal. Is that right? We are developing that right now. Yeah. The great screenwriter Vanessa Taylor is working on the outline now. So I and interviewed John Carreyrou for the podcast as well, his, his book, Bad Blood, which was terrific. Oh, so good. He's a great journalist too. Um, will that, yeah. will that movie be a, a tragedy as well with comic elements? You know, I can't help myself. I, whenever it's a character, I always just go to what's the heartbreak in the character and even with Elizabeth Holmes, I was like, what's her heartbreak? How do you get like that? So I don't know. Probably not. That sounds too much like Vice. But it'll, it'll be different. It definitely will be. Will more be. Like Ron, will it be more like Anchorman? It's going to be exact. It'll I would be do, a remake. I would, do a, I would do a sort of cross between Anchorman and Talladega Nights. I think that would capture <laughs> the essence of Theranos, I think, very well. I'm, I'm gonna happy do, to be a consultant on the on the film if you need. It's going to be a lot like Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. That's what the movie's <laughs> going to be like. <laughs> wow, you know, I think I think you're really pushing yourself as a director. I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Let me ask you this personal question: Are you, when you're at the Oscars, will you prepare an acceptance speech for if you win Best Director, or will you improvise that? I will very roughly. I'm not almost definitely not going to win best director. It's going to be Quaron, who, by the way, deserves it. Yeah. So he will win. But screenplay, I have an outside chance at. So I will, in my head, just get my thank yous in line. And then I'll think of one line that's kind of like a point, has a point to it. I'll do a line or two like I did last time. I said the thing about if you don't want banks and weirdo billionaires to control our country, don't vote for candidates 
that take money from banks and weirdo billionaires, I think was the line I ended up saying. So I got, well, you got to get one line in there. You got to get one. You got to get That's one. That's your moment. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't have uh, to so, thank you don't have to thank me this, but if you make a red dawn and it becomes big, then you then you got to thank me. I might just go up there and yell Wolverines, <laughs> and then just stand wow. there and stare down the audience for like twenty seconds, and when they don't respond, it just goes, none of you none of you get it. Only I'm, Preet and I get it. I'm now I'm, very embarrassed for both of us. <laughs> let me let me ask you. I know you got to go, and you got it. You got awards and Hollywood crazy Hollywood stuff that you do oh out there. Oh my god! Just one quick final question. Um, yeah, yeah. In what way, if at all, does the movie you just made, Vice, relate to or reflect the current times? It hopefully shows how where we're at now didn't just happen overnight. It wasn't some freakish occurrence out of left field. I mean, I think a lot of people inherently know that. And, you know, we really wanted to show through, in my opinion, the face that could best, you know, represent the Republican Party, Dick Cheney, a guy who's always been there in this zealot-like way, a guy who's had his power, a guy who's very mysterious. But yeah, you see the rise of this party and it flows right into where we're at now. And it's funny, when we were making the movie, we were highlighting the unitary executive theory. And now clearly that's becoming a big point of discussion. So there are just little details in the movie, whether it's, you know, Scalia and the Supreme Court and voting down the recounts and the death tax and the way they played with language and the think tanks and the that all just is now. I mean, we were shooting the scene with Frank Luntz talking about the death tax versus the estate tax on that very day. And a crew member came up and said, look what they just put in the Republican tax bill. They're going to limit the estate tax and eventually get rid of it. I mean, it it kept happening during the making of the movie. The truth is the story of Cheney is is the story of now. And, and we're just living in the the era of the Republican revolution. And I, and I keep saying it, if you're a Republican, you should be happy about that. Like some of them get mad when I say that, but it's like, it's true. Like <laughs> you guys why, why did, did they, Why do they, why do they, why do they get mad? Cause I think they like to be the underdog. Right. They like to be that. Well, oh, that's the American way. Yeah. It's the liberal conspiracy. It's the liberal media. The liberals are in charge. They're the ones who are ruining everything. So when I say like, no, you won, like the Republican revolution worked, uh, you know, Everyone wants to be the underdog, um, so sometimes they get annoyed. But I have heard a couple of people go, a couple of Republicans go, yeah, you're right. Like, And I'm like, yeah, you should. Why are you upset? You got everything you wanted, you know. You're never going to hear them say that. But, I mean, you know, taxes are lower than they've ever been. Loopholes are greater than they've ever been. Yeah, there's, always the, there's always the threat that it will be taken away. Whatever side is on top, you can't allow your constituents to feel that they're on top necessarily so that they become complacent. You know, there's always the threat of the I, thing yeah. that you have established is going to be taken away. You're right. When was the last time Democrats were on top? Can you remember? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think Obama had the presidency in both houses at one point. But, yeah, but I think he only had 60 days, wasn't it, of filibuster-proof uh, Senate? Because the second he lost that, and... they were no longer on top. <laughs> yeah. Well, then there's also the courts, and the courts are a separate matter. Yeah, yeah. But the liberal, you know what the liberals have? You know which branch of government the liberals have? They have Hollywood. <laughs> and and you're and you're a big you're a big deal in that in that branch. So you have Wolverines. all the, I think you have all the power. Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see you now, oh I'm going to say that. Oh my god. <laughs> Adam McKay, good luck. We'll be watching. Looking forward to the next film also. Thanks again for your time. Pre, thanks for having me on, man. It was a, a real pleasure. So this podcast episode drops on February 14th, 2019, which throughout America is known as Valentine's Day. It's a time to celebrate lots of things, eat chocolate, I suppose, go out to dinner, give flowers to the people you love. But it's also, uh, as you know, a very, very sad anniversary of a terrible day in America, because February 14th is also the one-year anniversary of the terrible and tragic shooting in Parkland, Florida, at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where a gunman, armed with an AR-15, shot and killed 17 people, 14 young people, three adults. And in many ways, America has not quite been the same. So on this day, we think about the people lost, we think about their families, and we think about 
the terrible continuing tragedy of these shootings, which have not really abated since last year. So we can be sad about it, we can be hurt by it, but we can also think about some of the good things that have come as a result of it. Shootings are not over. Reasonable gun laws have not been passed everywhere. But I think there is reason, with a year's hindsight, to be optimistic in some ways. There's been a rise in participation among people who care about these issues, especially among young people. There has been a rise, as Shannon Watts has told us on this show in the last year, in reasonable gun laws being considered in state houses across the country. The House of Representatives Judiciary Committee had its first hearing on gun violence in many years, just last week. And there has been an increase in participation in politics by people who I think will be reasonable about gun safety. One example is a person by the name of Marcel McClinton, who is 17 years old, who survived a shooting in 2016, and is now running for Houston City Council. More prominently, former astronaut Mark Kelly, who is the husband of shooting victim, former Representative Gabby Giffords, is running for the Senate in Arizona. And there are other examples as well. In my own house, uh, I have three young children, one in middle school, two in high school, who have had to deal with the fear of worrying about what might happen at their school, dealing with drills, and I have seen them become more active and more engaged and going to marches and figuring out how they want to be involved and participatory in democracy. My daughter, who's just 17 still, really regrets that she wasn't able to vote in the midterm elections. And my son, who's 15, feels the same. And I can't remember a time when young people in this country, and not just the people who have become known from Parkland, but also my own kids and their friends and in communities all over the country, there are young people who care, who are voting, who want to vote, who want to run, who want to make a change and a difference in the world. And I think they will. Well, that's it for this episode of Stay Tuned. Thanks again to my guest, Adam McKay. If you like the show, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. Send me your questions about news and politics. Tweet them to me at Preet Bharara with the hashtag AskPreet. Or give me a call at 669-247-7338. That's 669-24-PREET. Or you can send an email to staytuned at cafe.com. Stay Tuned is presented by CAFE. It's produced by Kat Aaron and the team at Pineapple Street Media, Henry Malofsky, Joel Lovell, Jenna Weiss-Berman, and Max Linsky. The executive producer at CAFE is Tamara Sepper, and the CAFE team is Julia Doyle, Calvin Lord, Vinay Basti, and Jeff Eisenman. Stay Tuned is produced in association with Stitcher. I'm Preet Bharara. Stay Tuned.